everybody. So there was a time when I was washing dishes. It's one of those times, one of those days when you keep washing dishes and the pile just never seems to get any smaller. And you know, that's always really frustrating. I was getting really frustrated and just keep on washing dishes. I had, a, I had an idea, an idea that I thought was brilliant. I was like, you know, what if there was a machine? What if there was a machine, kind of like a conveyor belt, that would take your dishes and wash them for you. <laughs> and I, I had this stroke of inspiration. I yelled across the apartment to my roommate, said, hey, and I gave him a couple of sentences. He was just like, dude, use the dishwasher. <laughs> Touche. I had forgotten that a dishwasher existed for a couple of minutes. So obviously, that idea didn't go anywhere. But that does bring up a question I want to ask you all to think about today. What makes an idea stick? We all have ideas. Some ideas come from eureka moments. Others that you have to think about a lot, you have to put a lot of effort into developing them. But the, in the end, we all have ideas, only some of them stick. And what I've found is that taking an, um, what, the one thing you can count on is that when you're taking an idea and turning it into a reality, that experience will test three things. Self-trust, creativity, and persistence. Now, before I talk about and dive into why these three things are so especially crucial to this process, I'm going to tell you a little. I'm going to take it back and tell you about our story, where we all started. So, the four of us at uh, we were four seniors at NC State University in the Material Science and Engineering Department, and we, as seniors, we had to do something a senior design project, and. In senior design, like we were actually part of this, something called the Engineering Entrepreneurs Program, which is really cool. Uh, you get to, they help you build a business around a product that solves some sort of societal problem. And we were really excited by this. One of the very first things that you do in the class is actually you sit down, you brainstorm with your team um, all the different problems that you are interested in. So we formed a team, we brainstormed, we had lots of different ideas, but nothing really stuck. Nothing really hooked us. So we sat down, we had a heart to heart, tried to figure out who we were, like, what we were like. And what we realized is that we had become engineers because we wanted to change the world for the better. We, we wanted to do something that, that mattered. We weren't interested in making the next money making gadget. We wanted to create a product, we wanted to develop something that actually impacted people's lives for the better. So as we got to know each other, what we realized is that we all knew someone who had been affected by date rape drugs. All four of us. Now, <laughs> what can four engineers do about su like, such a societal problem? Well, we had absolutely no idea for a really long time. We talked to women's centers. We, ta we talked to a bunch of different people, trying to figure out, just learning more about the problem, talking to our friends who had been through the experience. And the, actually, the first idea we came up with was the idea of an at-home pee kit. So one of the biggest problems with, um, like with this problem is that, like, when you uh, victims have to overcome the stigma of actually like, speaking out about their problem and like, going to a doctor, things like that. So this at-home pee kit was our attempt to try, try to let people overcome that stigma. They could gather the, like, individuals could gather the, gather the evidence on their own. They could, at some point, whenever they felt ready, go talk to somebody about it. But after thinking about it, we realized that this didn't really affect the core problem. We wanted to do more than just identify that someone had been drugged. We wanted to prevent it from ever happening in the first place. So we took a step back. And actually, even more than that, we wanted to, we wanted to make it impossible, or we wanted to make criminals not commit the crime in the first place. So we fell in love with the idea of a deterrent. Now, how do you create a deterrent for a problem like this? Well, we thought about it, we said, OK, if we can create a product that's discreet, Something that a perpetrator won't necessarily know if an individual is wearing it or not. Now, what happens is you shift the fear from victims to perpetrators and make it possible for criminals to get caught. And so, Undercover Colors was born. Or so we thought. <coughs> so this is where the first test came in, self-trust. We thought, we, we, knew, we knew this problem. We thought, yes, this is definitely a problem. Our professors didn't agree with us. They said, you know, this isn't really an addressable market. This isn't really a problem on college campuses. 
He said, okay, well, we disagree with you, but, but like when, when we heard this from, these, uh, from our professors who are uh, successful entrepreneur, entrepreneurs, that was a big blow, especially since we had spent so much time trying to understand what we really cared about working on. So, but we weren't ready to give up just yet. So we said, okay, you know what, let's, let's trust in ourselves. What, we believe in this, there's, there's something here. So we said, okay, well, if we, we, we know this is a problem, but we need to prove it to our professors. How do we do that? Well, uh, we escaped, uh, just like kind of ran around on afternoons. You know those annoying kids with the clipboards and the, <laughs> yeah. So we were those annoying kids with the clipboards at NC State, Duke, and UNC, all three schools. We covered them all, spoke to over 100 women, and polled them just to understand how much of a problem they thought drug-facilitated sexual assault was on their campuses. Even we weren't prepared for the outcome. 46% of women we spoke to said they worry about their drink being spiked when they go out. 46%. And an astonishing 53% actually know someone who's been drugged. We took, that, we took those results, we did, we did the research, as I learned back here at Science and Math several years ago. We did the research, we took it to our professors, and I can promise you they changed their opinions very quickly. Said, okay, this is, this is a real thing. We are fully in support and we wanna do what we can to help you. Like, great, test number one completed. Trust in yourself. That led straight into the next test. So, namely, uh, we had to actually create a proof of concept. We had to, cre create a, a pr we had to make this product a thing. Um, so, the first thing we had to do was, well, as four engineers, we all had some lab experience, but we're not PhD chemists. None of, we're, we're still not PhD chemists. <laughs> <laughs> but what we realized is that we have, an, we have access to an incredible network of brilliant researchers and professors here in the Triangle. We, we ended up speaking to, we reached out to dozens, literally dozens of professors at NC State, Duke, UNC. We actually even Skyped a professor in Singapore uh, which was interesting because there's a 12 hour time difference. So it was midnight for us and noon for him. But all of these professors provide us with like little tidbits of really helpful information, but with one pretty universal caveat. They said, you know, this is a really cool idea, but I, I don't know if it's possible. Like, wait, what, what, what do you mean it's not possible? You guys know chemistry, this should be possible, right? Uh, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> and even to design an experiment, just like a proof of concept, concept experiment, they said, is something that would probably be a PhD thesis, something that would take five, six years. Like, okay, uh, that's great. We don't have that kind of time. <laughs> We're seniors and are about to graduate. <laughs> so, um, that was, and right after we learned that, we also realized that the drugs that we needed access to to be able to complete our testing are regulated by the DEA. <laughs> so, I don't know if, how many of you, if any, has, if anybody's ever worked with the DEA, but put yourself in a DEA officer's shoes. Imagine getting a letter in the mail one day, reading it and realizing that four college seniors had just sent you a, a, a snail mail asking to get, be granted access to date rape drugs for research purposes. <laughs> we were told that it would take a minimum, of, they, were, they were very skeptical. They said, okay, um, it's gonna take at least six months and upwards of $50,000 to be able to get that access. Whew, we had neither of those things. <laughs> so, all right, ouch, uh, but we decided to be creative. What did we do? Well, luckily we were at NC State and NC State has a vet school. Professors at the vet school do research with these drugs. So we found a professor that was already using the, most of the drugs that we needed to be able to test our, um, our product and were able to basically file an independent project with him. We were able to scrape together a little bit of grant funding and purchase our own materials. And in a month and a half, we had everything we needed to go into the lab and actually start, start building the product, which is great. But it's only helpful to have a lab and a place to do the mad science if you have a plan. We didn't have a plan. We had all those tidbits of information and all this advice from smart professors and researchers saying, hey, this is impossible, which is not a plan. Um, but what we did was we were able to, we're, I mean, we were smart. We decided to do the research. We looked up the chemistry. We talked to people. We pulled together a kind of cohesive plan. And then 
brought together a panel of expert researchers from multiple disciplines. Because when we, when we had first talked to them, we realized that you know, like we were talking to them individually, and they all had, they all had problems necessarily with how it, how it would happen. So we had professors from food science, polymer and color chemistry, um, like calorimetric science, all different places. And at the end of it, after lots of rounds of feedback, we actually had a plan. And so I got in the lab and started our testing. I was our first, I was our first chemist, which is not a good idea, by the way. <laughs> but by April of our senior year, we had what was considered a proof of concept that was good enough to win the Lulu E Games startup competition at NC State. Awesome. Creativity actually paid off. It worked. We were able to get to a place that we would not, had no idea would have been possible. So, great. Now we had some, we had a few thousand dollars in funding. We had institutional support. We had some traction. Great. But it's April. And we're all about to graduate in less than a month. So now came the tough decision. What do you do? Are, we re are you ready? Are we ready to take this senior design project to the next level and build it into a company? Here comes the third test. Managing expectations. <laughs> Managing expectations is really tough, especially when those expectations are rooted in a lifetime of cultural and individual upbringing. As a second generation Indian American immigrant, I spent my life learning that success is stability. Being a doctor or engineer was kind of the way to go, and being, like, so you could provide for your family. But that's not necessarily the only way to go. And what we realized is, you know, you, son, you can be anything you want to want. You want to, and you can be anything you want, doctor, engineer. And actually, I was doing a pretty good job. I was a fourth year in engineering school. I was planning on going to grad school. I was like, wanted to get my PhD. I was like, you know what, I'm doing a good job. But I had never really stopped to consider whether that was something that I was meant to do or even if that was something that I really wanted to do. And our, profession, our, um, our parents speak a completely different language when it comes to professional life. Uh, they're going to hate me for this, but you want to do what? <laughs> you want to start nail polish company? <laughs> it was a hard sell. <laughs> Luckily, my parents are awesome. They're in here in the audience, so shout out to them. <laughs> Luckily, they're awesome, and they're adaptable and understanding, and they actually got over the initial discomfort pretty quickly. It actually ended up being a lot tougher for me, because you see, th that external, external um, expectation was real. It's definitely it's significant, but what's worse is the internal manifestation. When that external expectation goes towards becoming an internal resistance, you, what happens is you end up becoming your own worst enemy. I knew this was something that I probably wanted to do, but I had let it build up to myself, and like I was, pre I was my, I was my own worst enemy. So I ended up staying with Undercover Colors um, full time until we ha ha got our first full round of funding, and then um, after at that point, we hired a couple of key chemists who came in and tried to clean up the bumbling attempts that I had had in lab to try to make a breakthrough. Um, and then I actually went to grad graduate school. I got through one year of my PhD and realized that. I had nowhere near the same level of passion for academia as I had for startups. In one year of starting a company, I had learned more than I ever would ever doing anything else. I was officially addicted. So that was enough, to, that was enough for me to realize, you know, maybe this isn't, the right, this isn't the right thing for me. And at this point, actually, I'll be finishing up my master's in the spring from Duke in me mechanical and material science engineering. And I'm ready to jump back into the startup world. And I want to, I want to go back to the uh, question. So un uh, an update on Undercover Colors. We've come a long way. Since we graduated and had that first proof of concept, we now have, we've expanded from our initial team of four to eight full-time employees. We have a world, like a world over, we have investors and advisors and incredible mentors that have been there every step of the way to help us succeed. We have, um, we've raised just over $1.5 million in funding, and we should be releasing a product in 2017. So we've come a long way. But the biggest thing I realized is that coming back to the idea of how ideas stick, 
you know, at any one of those three points and all, uh, those three tests that we had, and really any number of other tests that we faced along the way, this could have just been one of those ideas that didn't stick. So what was it that made it stick? And what I realized, and I have a really, really cliche answer for this, um, but really it's you do, right? As when you're passionate about something, it's not about, it's not about something you want to do anymore. It's something you can't live without. Something, that's the only thing you can do. And really, it's OK if you're not passionate about any one thing. I'm not passionate about any one thing. I'm passionate about doing lots of things. Really, just I like building things. I like being there at the very beginning when something doesn't exist and building it up into something. And that's, that's, kind of the, that's the only thing you can do. So in closing, what makes an idea stick is those three traits. Being able to trust yourself, be creative, and persist, and adapt to any of the, the hurdles that things will throw along with. If you're starting your own venture, or if you're working on a research project, what have you. Those are the three things that I have personally found that you need to be able to do to overcome any challenge. Thank you.